Don't leave. Don't leave. This is uh, Dennis right. Dyack and Planet GameCube. Hi, Dennis. Hey, how are you? Pretty good. All right, we'll just uh, here's which, the whole which game. Which cameras do I look at? <laughs> we'll, we'll get set up here. You have two faces, right? <laughs> this is like David Letterman. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Oh, I just I was just asking if you had a good show. I was just you know not like hey to start the interview off. You well, know? no, I just say. Okay, go ahead. So are you guys all recording everything? Uh, and yeah, now. I think we are. I mean, this okay. is you know recording. I'm just going to date this. What is today's date? Today is the 18th? 18th. Yeah. That's our fearless leader. I'm probably going to cut it off halfway because I need to do another interview. Live but, you know. here at uh, E3 2001. You're sitting with the entire staff of Planet GameCube, pretty much, as well as uh, a very special guest. And if you could introduce your name and uh, who you work for. Hi, um, I'm Dennis Dyack. I'm the president of Silicon Knights. And uh, my role in Silicon Knights is director of... Uh, projects that we do, um, and currently what we're showcasing today is Eternal Darkness uh, for Nintendo GameCube, which was a new announcement as of three days ago. It was finally announced for the game. Yes, yes <laughs> it was. Um, uh, I know there's been a lot of rumors since, I, I think there's been a few press interviews, they were pretty much said it out loud, but didn't completely come forward. Um, what we really wanted to do with that, and the reason all that was done, is we wanted to um, introduce some new things this year. I think you'll find a lot of the uh, other hardware vendors, other first parties, are doing a lot of Me Too products. And what we did with Eternal Darkness, and the reason that we moved it over, which I know is going to be a question, so I'll answer it now. Um, we were almost finished Eternal Darkness on the N64. And when we when we thought about making the transition, um, it was very, very difficult for us. Uh, we had a lot of positive feedback. A lot of people really liked it. Um, and we know that some people were going to be disappointed with it. But we looked at it from an overall strategy from Nintendo in general, and um, we just looked at it and said, would this be better as a launch product? And imagine this as a Nintendo launch. And what a lot of people don't realize, uh, we did not port the code for Eternal Darkness. It is rewritten from scratch, and it actually uses a subset of the two human engine. Um, so if you want a slight glimpse of two human, you're looking at it already and probably didn't realize it. Comments from the forklift. We have to understand, um, uh, certainly Eternal Darkness, when we decided to write it from scratch and not port it, there were three or four months where there was, there was nothing anyone could look at. There's a lot of nervous people, um, and um, including us. Um, and we got, some, we got some mail from people saying, please don't change it. This will be one of the best N64 product, products ever. Um, we had, uh, I saw various articles, people saying why it shouldn't be ported over to the GameCube. But at the end of the day, um, well, that's cool, um, and, and I think that's a valid opinion. And um, I hope by at least what we showed today that people see the advantages and why we did that. Um, we're really, um, our job is to entertain people, and we have to do our best to entertain people as best we can. And um, I think Eternal Darkness having 40 to 60 hours of gameplay which is really looking, uh, which is really a fourth or fifth generation product, bringing, to bring that title on launch is pretty unprecedented. And so, you know, of course, Nintendo and Silicon Knights talked about that, and I'll answer this question too, it was, it was a mutual decision. You know, uh, we, we talked about it and said, let's do it. And uh, for a while, Silicon Knights was in shock as well. Um, so, you know, hope that answers the question. How long, uh, how long ago technically was this decision made? That's one of the things we're not talking about. All I can say, though, is that us, like everyone else, uh, would have liked to have uh, you know, development systems as soon as possible. Uh, we have not had the development systems for probably as, as long as people think we have. And um, the, uh, hopefully that shows how really, truly easy uh, the GameCube um, is, uh, I guess, uh, programmable, or how easy it is to make a game for that system really shines by what we've got here today. We, we, uh, we pulled significant parts out, 
Um, but we also threw some really cool things in at the last minute. So um, it's, it's a fun machine. We really like it. Is there anything you're going to miss about the N64 at all? Oh, well, certainly it was a great system. Um, the Yeah, there, there are some things about the N64 I think are cool. Um, however, uh, in the face of the GameCube, um, I think it's pretty clear here in the show uh, that Nintendo is, uh, with this system, uh, is really going to dominate the next generation. And what I think the, game, what the GameCube does is it's really going to change the, uh, uh, generally, But the things that I, I really equate to this when I think about it, so yeah, I'll miss the N64, but um, I really love the GameCube, and I'm not going to miss it too much. Um, so it's, it's, it's a great system. Um, back in, you know, I'm, I'm a big historical buff, um, and I like to study history, and I think what we're seeing here now uh, is history repeat itself. If you look at the film industry in the 1930s, um, and I'm answering the same question, believe it or not. Um, if you if you look at if you look at the game uh, the film industry in the 1930s, the people who dominated the film industry were people who um, who could cut the tape the best, who did all the tricks with the wires the best. These are the type of people who um, had people flying around on wires. People, go, wow, look what they can do with film. Those people dominated the film industry. Then, around 1940s, 1950s, 1950s, something happened, and what happened was um, the camera became standardized, and all of a sudden. All these editing techniques became available to everyone. So tools were invented, people could splice, people could cut, put sound in just like everyone else. Then what happened is a, an industry paradigm change occurred and the people who used to dominate with the tricks went away and the people who used to be able to write the good stories began to dominate and those people are still here today. Those people like MGM, Universal, all those players are still alive today. And what's happening with the GameCube and what's going to continue to happen now and um, is with the GameCube, you, as you can see hopefully by the, the titles on the show floor, to make graphics look good is not as difficult as it used to be. Uh, I really feel so sorry for the people, uh, first parties at Microsoft and Sony, because they still have to fight their hardware. They still have to play with wires and cut the film. With the GameCube, you can concentrate on making the content, and what I think is going to happen now, the people who are focusing on content and focusing on story are really going to start to dominate the industry. Um, and with with that kind of approach, you'll notice, despite what I think is pretty clear at this point, the GameCube is dominant as far as technology goes. You look, I have not seen anything on the Xbox so far that can even touch what we're doing with Eternal Darkness. We never drop below 60 frames per second. There are people saying, oh, can you do volumetric fog? We're doing volumetric rolling fog. It's not even affecting the frame rate. And then I, I, I would, as an example, and uh, I know I, I know they'll probably fix it up and my hats are off to them, but I'm not interested in playing a game that's four-player split screen that runs at 12 frames per second. You know, and I'm not going to mention the game, but, uh, um, you know, they're, they're going to have some serious problems. They, they have, with, with, with the PlayStation, you basically have issues with texture mapping, and uh, so you can only fit so many textures. And obviously, with uh, hopefully with uh, you can see with the terminal darkness, there's lots of room for texture. With uh, the PC, you've got bottlenecks on the bus. So what happens is you, you get inconsistent frame rates all the time. With the way the GameCube is set up, with the Mosis RAM um, and the other the, the other uh, configurations, it's really just a well-balanced system where really you can take the system and do with well with it. So. That's, uh, that's where I think things are going, and um, so the answer to that question, I guess, is answered. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry if I was too long winded. Uh, Eternal Darkness has been, <coughs> was at E399. It was at, it was here last year at E3 2000. Yes. And now it's here this year at E3 2001. Um, technically, how long has Eternal Darkness, um, from like early conception throughout development, how long has that? That been? Well, we, we are, are actually not talking about the length of development time for our products. Uh, we, we, that's just uh, stuff, something we stay away from. However, um, you can be guaranteed of several things uh, with our development phases. The story has not changed. Um, we have not removed anything uh, by bringing uh, Turtle Darkness to the GameCube. We've added substantial portions. And uh, if anything, the game is much bigger. The vision of the game is much more fulfilled. And, um, I really think it was a good move. 
Um, you know, I wish that some stances, or some circumstances, that maybe we wouldn't show the Turtle Marbles as much. Um, I really think the strategy that uh, Yamauchi-san uh, has done from the beginning since Space World has been extremely effective. You've got, you had Sony talking about how great their system was going to be. You had Microsoft saying they were going to push 3 million polygons per second, which was um, pretty um, unreasonable, I'll put it that way. And um, at the end of the day, you know, you look, just look at the systems at the show and it's pretty clear that uh, the GameCube can more than hold its own and not dominate. So that period of silence can be very effective for marketing. We're, we're um, really not into doing too much media. Um, and I, it's not clear to me how much, we're certainly not gonna do screenshot of the week. I think that's just gonna bore people. Um, I know there's some products with the, how many screenshots of the week they've done. If you put them all together, you can create your own little FMA of what the game's gonna look like. You know, we don't wanna do that. Uh, we want people to have an experience. That's why we pulled a lot of the story elements out in this show. We showed enough of the story last time, though it's, what we showed is nothing compared to the entire experience, so. Um, so, um, there you have it. There's my opinion on that. Um, that is the question. Yeah, that's it. Okay, cool. Um, one other thing about the, the transition from uh, the N64 to the GameCube. You've talked already a lot about the power of the GameCube. Um, what about the new controller in comparison to the N64 controller? A lot of people thought that the N64 controller was like probably one of the best controllers ever um, just because it was totally different. Obviously, Sega and Sony liked it because they pretty much mimicked it up and Microsoft. And then, well now we have this brand new controller um, that a lot of people just completely just don't get it. They think it's just nuts, but once you hold it, you know, at least for me personally, it's a totally different experience. What do you think, uh, what do you think the new controller adds to the Eternal Darkness world? Well, certainly um, I would agree with many things that you said there, particularly that the N64 controller was by far the best for its time. Um, I was blown away when I saw the GameCube controller. I was like, wow, this is way better. And I didn't, I really was concerned about what the, what the controller was going to be, but uh, Miyamoto-san is uh, very focused on these issues. He's created something great. Uh, the controller itself, what, what have we done with it? Uh, we're scratching the surface right now, but one of the things uh, which may not have been immediately apparent in the demo is when you squeeze the lock button, you know how you can click? If you hold the analog down and just click and not let it go, you actually cycle through the enemies in order. So you can actually, with with the shifters, do different things. Um, this, is that kind of like the uh, Z-triggering um, with uh, the Z-targeting with Zelda? Yeah, it's similar to that. Um, However, it's it's a it's a it's a bit more subtle, I guess. Um, that was um, that was a technique that we've just recently done, and it seems to really work. It's something you're not, you know, we're not we didn't explain on the show floor, but it's when you pick up the game and play it, uh, it's really important that people know what enemy they're targeting. That's a real problem with uh, some other you know games uh, when enemies are coming at the screen. When you're in third person, targeting can be very difficult. And uh, what what I found very interesting is um, by highlighting the body parts. Um, we thought we had shown that before, and I, I'm just, I thought we had, but apparently we hadn't. Um, and no, actually people, you didn't, because you showed me yesterday how to do that. Yeah, Very and cool. uh, that was a surprise for us. We didn't know that that was going to be a big deal. People we went, wow, you can target body parts? We're like, last year you could target, but they didn't highlight. Yeah, yeah. okay. Well, you you once you really lop off someone's someone. head, everybody's going to go, ooh, that's <laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the interesting thing, and it's, it's, it's not really clear in what we're showing here, but all of the enemies in... Uh, none of which we've shown to the public at all. Um, I, I really hope that people think that it's going to be mostly zombies because they're really underestimating just as much as just about as much as they've underestimated the GameCube. Um, the enemies in that combat system are built together, so there are going to be some things that you want to use missile weapons for. You're going to want to dismember some creatures. There are going to be others. You just don't want to do that. You want to handle them completely differently. And if you want to go in there brute force, that's up to you. But you basically need to get your ass kicked. Um, and the other, um, the other thing that's very interesting that, that we really haven't shown yet is there's a real um, coordinated uh, combat system where enemies will work differently together in groups. So you might have basically a front line of enemies of zombies coming at you, you're like, oh no, but that's not your biggest problem. You gotta worry about what's behind them. And you really haven't shown that yet. And that's gonna be very different. We think people are gonna really enjoy that experience.